Did you know that Energy Australia, one of Australia's largest utilities, has set the goal of being carbon neutral by 2050? How are they going to make this transition? This is the Lovers of Exchange podcast. I'm your host, Jimmy Gia. Today's guest is Stuart Hillen. Stuart is part of a team of commercial managers at Energy Australia searching for new infrastructure technologies to help meet the transition goals of a carbon neutral future. Season three is brought to you by a generous grant from the Skoll Center for Social Entrepreneurship at the Said Business School, Oxford University. If you're new to this podcast, please don't forget to subscribe. Now, let's listen to how Stuart leans into his civil engineering background when financing new infrastructure projects. Well, Stuart, thank you very much for joining us today. It's great to have you on this podcast. Thanks very much for having me, Jimmy. Good to be here. So Margaret Thatcher once said that you and I might travel by road and rail, but economists travels by infrastructure. And you being trained as a civil engineer, I wanted to start it by asking, what's your favorite infrastructure? I think it does go back to the days when I did originally pick civil engineering as a as an area I wanted to start, even though I didn't sort of really work as a civil engineer per se. But I think for me, there was this weird fascination with anything to do with water and big sort of civil infrastructures associated with dams. Strangely, I'm also Dutch, so I don't know whether that has any sort of random connection to (laughs) Dutch people having a mastery of water and maybe it's in my blood, I don't know. But yeah, I've always found civil infrastructure associated with whether it's road or water or rail or things that actually provide some sort of use to humanity, particularly interesting and exciting. I think, you know, the construction of those sorts of projects are are really cool. But if I were to sort of try and pick one, I think I think it's hard to go past a really large, cool dam, <laughs> kind of weird as that sounds. Or a well-designed bridge. I, I'm fond of a nice bridge as well. I think they're very cool pieces of infrastructure. A bridge probably provides sort of more fundamental change to people as well, right? Connecting to communities and, you know, completely changing an outlook for for people as well. So I think also a nice piece of infrastructure. But certainly in the energy sector, I think, you know, as well, water and and civil infrastructure and dams are sort of increasingly important part of the mix as well. It's sort of this very old, old technology that kind of new and in vogue again, if you think of pumped hydro and the role that pumped hydro can play in the energy transition. One of my favorite bridges though is, uh, my brother lives in, in Hong Kong and last time I was there, which was before the MBA actually, uh, haven't been there for a while sadly, but it's uh, a bridge that I, I think is going to mainland China and it actually sort of hovers over the cross of the water and then the entrance goes into a tunnel and so it's sort of this island that's the entrance to a tunnel in the middle of, of Hong Kong Harbor uh, and then a bridge seemingly coming completely out of the water. It's um, both an architecturally beautiful piece of infrastructure, but amazing to think of the engineering that sits behind it as well and visually very cool. Yeah, and for sure. And given that you studied civil, you know the level of effort it took to be able to make something like that happen. And I probably have a better appreciation of that than most people. And so from those days, what do you think were the critical skills that you learned as a civil engineer that helps you right now on your day-to-day job? I think engineering is one of those great degrees around a lot of people that listening to this uh that might have done engineering as well may not have actually gone into engineering like my like me I went into strategy consulting at Deloitte straight after engineering and and so I sort of felt like a, a bit of a fraud you know was I really an engineer but I think it's a way of thinking and it teaches you a certain um, skill set around problem solving and around analytics and around not being sort of I think intimidated by a concept I think if you sort of research something enough and try and try and understand a particular problem engineering teaches you that you should be able to sort of get to the bottom of something or get to the bottom of a a problem and and approach it with the skills that you learn through the degree so I think there's sort of a way of thinking from an engineering degree that is that is really helpful and I think sort of an appreciation of the complexity of actually building things I think sometimes if you're say in the finance world or in the tech world or in um not not sort of so much at the coal face of design of, of things, you, you might think that construction or particular part of designing something might be really simple and trivialized. But I think if you have studied, you know, engineering, then you realize that, you know, infrastructure can be really, really complex and there's there's a lot that goes into it. And I think appreciating that 
certainly in my current role, for example, I do project development now and appreciating that good design takes time, risks are important, safety is important, and you need to think about these things to make sure that a, an asset, if it's going to last 30 or 40 years, is sort of well thought through and there is good engineering that sits behind it. When you talk about the engineering approach or the problem-solving approach, how would you break it down? What is that approach that you take when you're faced with a problem? Sort of don't know whether it's a personal thing or whether it's perhaps a, it's an engineering skill set, but there's a, a desire, I think, at least when I approach a problem, to try and understand the first principles of a problem. And I just think of a, a work work example if it's looking at you know the value of a battery project and trying to understand how that asset might add value in the market and how it might be traded really understanding the first principles of how an electricity market works, how a trader would think about it, and sort of going down the rabbit hole is kind of part of that problem-solving approach. It's sort of not taking things on face value and trying to to understand the fundamentals and then sort of build that back up again and not being scared of detail or complexity, but also sort of trying to distill complexity into things that are things that you can act on and, and make decisions. So I think engineering is also really um, practical and pragmatic as well. Certainly civil engineers, I think, you know, you're talking about things that you can touch and feel and look at. I think there's other area, other types of in engineering that are probably much more challenging and difficult, but civil is really foundational and, and almost common sense in some in some way, which I think is is really helpful. You learn it when you're doing Lego blocks or you're mucking around with water at the beach or whatever it might be, there's a sort of real foundational component to civil engineering that anyone sort of intuitively understands and then you sort of apply, extrapolate those principles to more complex situations. I, I tend to consider myself a closeted urban planner and my favorite infrastructure are actually subways. And in every city, I really try to go and take a look at the subway system and, and see how they're designed and things like that. You've been at Energy Australia for a number of years now. What's your role inside of the organization? So at the moment, I do project development. So we do generation development for uh, a range of different things, batteries, you know, pumped hydro, gas peaking assets, anything that uh, is sort of dispatchable capacity, uh, and then also work with renewable developers as well. Um, so I guess it's a combination of project development is one of those great professions, I guess, where it's sort of an intersection of finance to get a project built, engineering and design to understand the cost and both CapEx and OpEx, political landscape as well, to understand the policies that impact the way that the electricity market works. And you need to sort of combine all those things together to get a project built. That's kind of the role. It's sort of drawing upon all those different elements within the organization and external to the organization. And so which stage of project development do you normally get involved in? Mainly, uh, so not construction. I guess we would call it, uh, and this is probably a general term across across the industry, so pre-development and development. And business development, I think, is sort of the general overarching term, sort of sourcing opportunities. And so that might be talking with developers and understanding what energy generation developments there might be out there and then sort of filtering those down to the ones we think are, are interesting and then sort of taking it through a pipeline of understanding the economics, understanding, you know, is this something, is this a project that we think would provide, would be interesting, provide value to the portfolio or, or it's a greenfield project and then you sort of have to, a greenfield means it's a project on your land that you're developing from scratch. And so then you all of a sudden have to do other pre-development activities like getting planning approvals and DAs and all that sort of thing. And so we sort of do all of that from preparing, identifying an opportunity, understanding if it's attractive enough to progress. And then if it is attractive enough to progress, sort of building the business case that sits around it. And then ultimately taking it all the way through to what we would call you know, FID, so financial investment decision. And so there's a huge amount of work that goes into getting to that point so that you can sort of confidently say, we think these are the returns of this project and whether it's something that we own and we're building or whether it's something that we're contracting, we're confident that these are the returns of the project. This is the risk file of the project. Yes, we're going to commit money and push go and you know people are going to go to site and construct or, or 
the people we're partnering with can go and do that. So you've got a an EPC contract. Right. And EPC is it's actually engineering procurement and construction contract. So it is quite common in the project development world, certainly in the energy sector, but I suspect also in most infrastructure projects where you would have one major contractor and they're sort of the lead contractor and they basically give you a total price for this project. They're going to have subcontractors that do all of the sub elements. And so as the sort of ultimate owner, you you don't want to necessarily have to have a a contract with the civil works and with the electrical developer, et cetera, et cetera. So you sort of have it over in one overarching contract. And that contract is typically held by the component of the project that is the largest cost. So take a battery project, for example, the civils. So, you know, building the roads and things to get the batteries there is probably only a small component, whereas the physical batteries themselves are the largest component. And so it's quite common for the EPC to be held by, say, the battery supplier in that case. We'll get to some of the stakeholder groups within how these projects get developed in a little bit. Before we go on, I wanted to clarify for the listeners what the business model is of a utility. Uh, We've had a couple of other utility executives come on to this podcast. Energy Australia sounds like it's a vertically integrated utility that owns generation assets, transmission assets, distribution assets, all the way down to customers. How does that system of being a vertically integrated utility influence the business model of the spending of money as well as the recovery of money? So in Australia, that's not quite how the market works, but it may be in in other places. But in Australia, there's sort of three big vertically integrated utilities, uh, Origin, AGL and Energy Australia, and they they all own generation assets, so power stations, wind farms, solar farms, gas power stations, coal-fired power stations, batteries, pumped hydro, et cetera. Uh, and they have customers, residential customers and mass buy customers. They don't all own the poles and wires in the middle. Um, so they're separate separate businesses that are regulated monopolies. And so the, the reason that mar- the market is set up like that, and it's much like the UK in this pool market sits in between, is that by having a retail customer base, have to buy electricity on behalf of your customers. And you are therefore exposed to the electricity market price. And so to hedge yourself against that risk, you can either enter into financial contracts or forward contracts with independent power producers that have power stations. So you might say, I'm going to lock in my electricity price for this many years. Or you can build your own power stations, which is a physical hedge, you would call it. And so that's why you find the vertical integration model uh, exists at least in in some of these markets with a with an energy pool market, so that you've got this hedge across your customer base and and your generation fleet, and so where that's really valuable is in project development, as you as you sort of point out. What it means is that when you're developing a project, if you're an independent power producer or a renewable energy developer, for example, you've got a wind farm and you need to sell that electricity to to someone in order to finance the project. So typically projects will be project finance. So that means they will go to a bank and and try and get a source of debt to fund the capital of that project, hundreds of millions of dollars. And they might have some smaller percentage, let's say 20% of equity, which they might get from a, a superannuation fund or a pension fund. And so what they need is a contract. They need a contract for 20 years uh, for someone to buy all of their output. So they want to sit in between and not really have any any risk. It's Uh, hard to get those contracts because you need someone that wants to buy electricity for 20 years. And so you might go to a big uh, industrial customer who might need that electricity, or you might go to a retailer, as I said before, who might not have uh, the physical generation. I guess what's handy about being vertically integrated is we are our own customer in a sense. So you have generation parts of the business that can develop energy projects, and then you have sort of a, um, a retail part of the business, which essentially is, you know, internally writing the contract to underwrite that that asset. Not that you actually write a contract, but sort of implicitly that's that's how it works. So it gives you a unique insight into the types of generation and the types of assets that you need to develop in order to supply your, your customers, which is a lot harder if you're an independent power producer, you build a power station and you sort of need to try and then shop around to find who is the the natural buyer of that. Yeah, and you know, with all the different assets that Energy Australia owns, I'm sure you have this hierarchy of what assets perform in different ways, how they perform, and you make sure you have the right physical portfolio mix. And then when you don't have 
the specific attributes. Maybe you procure it from the market or, or buy it from the grid, uh, other producers, something like that. Is that correct? Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and look, at the end of the day, you can you can just buy from the market. You can buy from the spot market because there is a pool market there, but you're at risk of, of high prices or, if you're lucky, low prices. Or, or instead, you can buy, and this is the same in many markets around the world and many, many of the, the markets in the US as well, you have financial markets that sit around. So derivative contracts, the most famous speculator energy trader is the one that went bankrupt, which was Enron. And so they they sort of will have been extremely active in the derivative market, whereby if you're a smaller electricity retailer, for example, you can go to someone like an Enron or insert a new company name that's not bankrupt <laughs> um, and and buy a forward contract to protect yourself and sort of lock in a price. So you don't you don't have to have physical generation. Normally though the people that are selling forward contracts typically have have some sort of physical generation. Otherwise it is it is risky. You're sort of you're making a bet that you know better than someone else about the future electricity price, which is possible. Some people maybe have conviction on that, but it's, it's just greater risk, I guess. And given that utilities have to effectively provide guaranteed power to their customers, their society, you know, residential consumers, commercial industrial consumers, the notion of dispatchable power then becomes incredibly important that you mentioned a moment ago. Could you describe dispatchable power and how it fits into the portfolio? Yeah, so dispatchable power, I guess, is becoming more and more talked about as around the world, the coal generation fleet sort of retires. And what we sort of took for granted as this, these sources of generation fuel that you could turn on and off all of a sudden aren't necessarily around as much. Dispatchable power is exactly exactly that. It's, a, it's sources of generation that have the ability to turn on and turn off at any point in time. And I guess another way to explain it is the opposite, which is energy that is generating intermittently so not necessarily random but wind and solar is is the obvious example where you don't necessarily generate at an even level and you can't turn on and off all the time if you think of the electricity system the total demand in the system varies over the course of a day and so you need in order to perfectly match supply and demand it's really useful to have a lot of renewables in the system but then i guess to kind of get you right up to the top you sort of need that dispatchable component to make sure that you're you are meeting the demand. And so storage falls into that bucket as well. So whether it's pumped hydro or whether it's lithium ion or thermal storage or, or any other type of storage, strictly speaking, it doesn't create energy. It's just soaking up uh, energy probably when it's cheap and then generating it when you need it. And so that might be you know, five, six, seven o'clock at night when demand is high. And so that's sort of dispatchable in the sense that you're choosing when to move that energy right. to and from. We can think of the battery as a way of arbitraging the price or time shifting the resource to from low price to high price or vice versa when uh, depending on what's available in the yeah. market, what's available on the grid. Exactly right. Yeah. Exactly right. So given these movements of fuel shifting globally right now, what do you see as the role of the utility in these transitions to cleaner fuels and uh, decarbonized futures? It's a really interesting space. I guess I'll caveat this is my personal view, so I'm not talking on behalf of my employer at the moment. So I, and I guess mainly because we're sort of Australian focused really, so I don't, don't really sort of focus internationally at all. So uh, I guess just reflecting on, on my time in the MBA and in the UK and sort of thinking about the global oil, oil and gas majors like Shell and BP and, and Exxon and seeing, seeing what they're doing. I think the broader trend is one of electrification which is probably the most important and fundamental. And so whilst I'm excited by hydrogen in its various forms and applications, I think certainly at the sort of personal vehicle level, it seems that you know electric vehicles are so far down the cost curve at the moment that I personally kind of see them as sort of winning that race. You're seeing now a proliferation of um, types of, of electric vehicle models and into the mass market sort of adoption, not so much in Australia actually, but I think it's only a matter of time very much driven by Europe and I guess the other big sources of demand. So I think because of the electrification of the transportation fleet and the increase in demand on the electricity system that that subsequently creates, I think there's some really interesting dynamics that, that come out of that. 
One is the changing shape of demand. When do people charge their cars and what are the infrastructure implications of that? So does peak demand, which is the maximum demand on the network, increase? Everyone thinks it's decreasing because there's energy efficiency and more efficient appliances. So so total consumption goes down. But if peak demand goes up, then actually you need more batteries, more dispatchable capacity to meet that peak demand. Or it could go other way. You know, those electric vehicles are much more sophisticated. The charging is much more smoothed and you sort of, you benefit from the fact that you've actually got quite a large battery sitting underneath an electric vehicle, which actually starts to kind of contribute to the energy system and increasing the total storage capacity in the energy system. So I think, yeah, this this electrification trend is really interest a really interesting one, and I think you know electric vehicles are, are one one example. I, I think there is quite a big indication of electrify everything as one of the pathways to reduce carbon, and it certainly speaks to a very big role for utilities to play in the future. It also implies potentially that we need to double the size of the electric sector just to be able to, as you say, absorb the energy that's currently inside the fossil fuels, inside the internal combustion engines, inside the transportation sector. Yeah, and I think that's right. I think, I mean, you look at the size of uh, the oil and gas majors as businesses and they're you know, hundreds of billions of dollars of market cap. And I guess they're, um, that's driven by the value they generate from from oil and gas. I mean, that will ultimately shift shift somewhere. And you can see it with with Shell making some pretty bold moves into the electricity space, same as BP, are pretty heavily invested into the electrification as they sort of, I guess, you know, see the writing on the wall, really. Yeah, for sure. So you've mentioned a smattering of technology so far, tech, uh, batteries, hydrogen, so on and so forth. But a question that comes up for me is that the technology cycle generally is around 6 to 18 months. When we start talking about some of these large you know, devices – batteries and stuff somewhat, their technology cycle might be a couple of years, five, seven years or so. But as a utility, when you invest in a piece of asset, you're investing for 20, 30, 40 years, if not longer. So as a project developer, how do you make those decisions of which cycles, which societal cycles, which societal behaviors to try to hit? I think it's really hard. <laughs> uh, I think, I mean, any long-term investment decision is is challenging. And I think the way you start is actually trying to think about how the future can play out what those sort of technology trends look like and sort of trying to trying to build that into your into your scenarios that you you look at in your business case and sort of test those bookends and test those fringe cases it that sort of still assumes that you have some sort of predictive capability which is really impossible forecasting is always wrong obviously like it's it's never going to be right, but I think it's the best you can do, and you sort of run downside cases and, and upside cases, to, to be frank as well. So I think that's that's certainly the first step. There's ways that you can construct business cases to sort of try and hedge out hedge out risk. You try and shorten the payback period as much as possible. So you might go for sort of higher returns uh, so that you can pay back uh, your asset faster, so that you know you're not relying on the full 50 years for it to be around for that long, for it to be to, to be paid off. Uh, the other really interesting thing I think is is thinking about modularity and incremental investing as opposed to big bang, you know, um, I'm taking one big hit at once. One of the cool things I think about storage, maybe more specifically batteries, is, is that modularity. If you take, whether it's lithium ion or, or flow batteries, lithium ion at least, you know, rather than building your sort of end kind of size project straight away, you might you might do it in phases, and so therefore you benefit from cost curve reductions or learning rates that that come out because manufacturing lithium ion batteries gets cheaper over time. And I think the other way is is going distributed. If you go distributed, you're making tiny little bets all the time, and so it's it's really sort of um, you're, you're averaging out that risk. If you average out that risk over time, yes, you're your early investments mightn't be as in the money, but your your longer investments, uh, sorry, the investments you make over time sort of, you know, reduce that risk. And then maybe the last one, you know, if you have a sort of a customer to share that risk with. And so what I mean by that is you might be making, let's say you build a, a, a wind farm now and the wind farm price is $2 million per megawatt or something like that. 
but you lock in a contract with the customer to buy all that energy, as I said before. If the if the cost of a wind turbine goes down, well, it doesn't really matter because your project has sort of reached financial close. You've got a contract that lasts for, for, for 20 years. You pay off your asset. And so the risk that sits at the back end, it's maybe not great for your project returns, but you've sort of tried to lock away as much of those revenues as possible. Now that's assuming you can find a customer to to do that. And so that's, again, I guess, back to your point about the vertical integration argument, right? You sort of you sort of manage that risk by 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 being vertically integrated as well. And what you're talking about is the need for business model innovation on top of these technology innovations. Just because it's a battery and it looks like an asset, the business model of that battery is could be completely different than the business model of a natural gas peaker plant. Totally. Totally. So how much then do you have to when you're project financing, when you're conceptualizing one of these you know, major constructions, do you have to take into account potentially new business models that utilities have not been exposed to before or have tried to execute before? Yeah, definitely. I, I think um, certainly new markets. So in Australia, the regulatory landscape is is changing to sort of recognize the fact that some benefits of big rotating thermal assets. So big coal-fired power station with a big turbine that's physically rotating, right? Like it's literally a giant rotating mass that actually provides stability to the network because it has something called inertia, which kind of goes back to the civil engineering days, right? You know, when you asked before, when it come in handy, you see words like that and you go, I know what that means. Yeah. When big things turn, they don't want to stop turning. Yeah, they don't want to stop, right? And so, and so when you take all of that big rotating mass outside, away from the electricity system, it becomes a little bit more frag- fragile. And so that's reflected in what's called frequency. Um, and so you get more frequency deviations. So the frequency is getting super nerdy, but it, more frequency deviation. It's funny though, you actually hear politicians talking about frequency in Australia, which is classic. You know, wouldn't have seen that 10 years ago. And so because of the, the frequency deviations, you know, the market operator is looking at introducing new markets to sort of value what was previously a service that was essentially provided for free. It was just this thing that existed because it was a large rotating mass. And now there are going to be new markets that open up and batteries can actually supply some of those services because they're super fast, they're super quick at responding. And I think the challenge is then trying to think about, okay, how do you value that? How do you value a new market that doesn't have a long history of prices or data that you can point to 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 kind of quantify. So these, I guess they're not new business models per se, but they're certainly new revenue streams that to the extent that you can quantify them or try to quantify them and you know include them into a, into a business case, then that might be what's needed to get a, get a project over the line. Yeah, this gets into the not often talked about field of ancillary services that utilities provide, whether it's voltage, sag, frequency, regulation, so on and so forth, to make sure that basically what we receive at the wall socket in the US, it's 60 hertz, it's 110 volts. In the UK, it's different. In Australia, it's different. But each country has their own specifications of what frequency, what voltage, what amps arrives in the wall socket. Exactly. And we can't deviate from that at all. Uh, and if no. that power outages isn't just loss of kilowatt hour energy, it could also be deviation from these very tight yeah. specifications. And you speak to someone, you know, we've had uh, lots of colleagues in the MBA from India and, you know, they're, they're very used to blackouts, right? That's just normal. <laughs> like they're just, um, and, and a lot of it is because of frequency deviation or, or, or simply because there's not, not, a lot, not enough generation. But there's there's controlled load shedding and so they'll shut shut the power down in certain certain sort of suburbs in order to to maintain frequency maintain that supply demand balance and then you know keep power going for the rest of the region but in the west you know we've sort of it's sacrosanct that electricity is on all the time you know and, and almost at all costs interestingly you know like uh, the level of reliability that's built into many electricity systems is uh extremely high because there's a very low tolerance for outages um, and for not having power for, for, for good reason. Speak to a little bit about the high costs that it takes to maintain this effectively 100% uptime. What type of physical infrastructure do you need to build? Well, you just simply need to make sure supply meets demand, right? So you need to have enough of a generation fleet uh, at all times such that supply meets demand. And so that means 
when I say all times, it needs to have redundancy in there because you always have outages. You always have a power station that might not be working for any particular reason, planned or unplanned. And so when you have thousands of these things across an entire energy system, you need to you need to kind of overbuild really so that at all times, at all hours of the day, every day of the year, no matter what the demand, no matter what people are using, there is enough generation to make sure that supply meets demand. And so you do need to overbuild and that comes at a cost. If you didn't do that, you would have lots of blackouts. And I know sometimes the overbuilding mentality is hone in on as waste because why do you need all of that? But yet if the requirement is 99.999% uptime, sometimes that physical hedge is required to just simply have more options, more physical options. Yeah, exactly. And the other thing you, I guess I'm talking about generation at the, at the moment, you know, networks and poles and wires are, are an important part of it as well. And so you might hear sometimes of gold plating where you sort of might overbuild network infrastructure and so there's always this balance it's sort of a bit of a sawtooth where you sort of you might overbuild because there's not enough infrastructure uh, and so you need to make the network stronger or build more or generation or, or whatever it might be and then you've realized you've overspent you know things get too expensive and so you then there's a period of perhaps under underbuilding and so if that's what sort of happens maybe that's sort of you could almost draw the you know, the big infrastructure spend in the US as an example of that, you know, a lot of the infrastructure roads and things in the US perhaps aren't what you might expect. But now you're probably <laughs> with the amount of money being thrown at the problem, it'll be gold plated roads, really, you know, <laughs> like it'll be amazing infrastructure. Um, well, and then, then realize it's too expensive, not yeah, for a while. <laughs> exactly. Or at least platinum infused with all the catalytic converters that are uh, spewing out platinum. Yes. The back. So... Yep. And another way of creating that type of resiliency is to also have fuel switching options. And so recently you worked on a hybrid power plant. Could you speak about how hybrid power plants work and what the advantages of those are? Yeah, so um, I guess you're sort of referring to hydrogen there. And I think hydrogen uh, has a really exciting role to play as a sort of substitution for natural gas in some power stations you can actually sort of burn uh, a combination of of hydrogen in natural gas but you sort of you can reach an upper limit so i think it's still pretty pretty nascent but it's certainly an exciting area because you potentially have a lot of these gas power stations which have traditionally burnt natural gas spend a lot of money to build those those assets and they need to decarbonize and so one way to do that is to have zero emissions fuel that's being burnt in those and so I guess a hybrid power station is is really that it's it's just a power station that's able to burn a combination of natural gas and and hydrogen um, or, or some other fuel. So is hydrogen just a drop in fuel for natural gas, or do you have to do something to it in order to make it work? There's still a bit of work to go. Again, this is not my uh, you know the actual sort of science of it itself and the the the, um, the process engineering side I can't speak to, but certainly in the the gas distribution network, for example. You know, there's there's plenty of reports that have talked about five percent blends of of hydrogen or up to ten percent blends of hydrogen sort of being fine in the existing infrastructure. You don't damage the pipes and 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 things like that. You can still have the the gas transported for long periods of time. You can still burn it in your appliances at home, for example, and it's lower emissions. You've got a ten percent blend of of hydrogen, um, so it reduces the emissions by that proportion roughly. But when you get up to higher percentages, that's when all of a sudden you start to, you know, you, you do need to kind of think through the materials implications of that. Does it burn at a higher calorific value? Uh, how does it impact the maintenance of the plant and those sorts of things? And so, you know, for hybrid plants that we've looked at, obviously have to, to look at that and understand the implications of that. But it's certainly an exciting way to decarbonize, I think. And it's a great way to not have a stranded asset you know the same for the pipes in the ground where there's infrastructure that's been built over decades that has cost many billions of dollars and it is actually a, a natural storage form actually if you've got these pipes in the ground that are that are using hydrogen and you're able to produce that hydrogen from surplus cheap renewables store it in the pipes and then burn it later with zero emissions in existing gas power station turbine then it's um Kind of win-win, I think. Have you seen as the trends of hydrogen investments? Are you working on hydrogen projects, trying to underwrite hydrogen projects, start hydrogen projects? 
Yeah, so there's um, there is a, a announcement today actually in Australia. So our renewable energy agency, Arena, just announced funding of around a hundred million dollars for three hydrogen projects, two in Western Australia and one in one in the East Coast, and they're they will be some of the largest electrolyzers in the world, which is pretty cool. They're all ten megawatts each. They're all going to be uh, well, two of them I think uh, producing green hydrogen. The other is is used to make ammonia, and so I think the electricity sector. Hydrogen is this really interesting nexus, I think, where you've got kind of natural oil and gas synergies because it's a molecule and it's a combustible molecule. And that's kind of the game that oil and gas majors play in and and the process engineering aspects of transporting it and producing it. But actually, the main input cost is electricity into an electrolyzer. And that's what electricity businesses do. So there's this really interesting role that for utilities, supplying electricity they're a big load. And then we also can use the gas potentially, whether that be in, in a hybrid uh, gas power station or, or just injected into the gas network and sold to our customers. So it's got, I think there's, it's just this really interesting combination. And I think there is, there is certainly an opportunity, but I don't think it's clear yet who the, the natural winner or owner of that infrastructure is to kind of answer your question. I think uh, utilities will continue to look at hydrogen, but there are, other players that may be better placed or, or might might win in that space more. Yeah, hydrogen electrolyzers produce the hydrogen, whether it's ammonium or hydrogen gas that then utilities can use inside of their infrastructure. So whether the utilities themselves produce it or not remains to be seen from the business model point of view, business model perspective, right? Yeah, that's right. And look, I think ammonia... Uh, and ammonia nitrate, as an example, you know, you you still produce hydrogen, you still make that gas, but uh, whether you blend it with natural gas and use it in the gas network, or you sell it to a fertilizer company um, to make ammonia nitrate for fertilizers or explosives, that's a totally different sort, a uh, so totally different use. And so, therefore, who is the best at layering up those? sources of demand, both the, the gas use, the, the use of hydrogen in its gaseous form, and then the use of hydrogen in its sort of um, fertilizer form, or, or putting it, turning it into ammonia and then putting on a ship and, and sending it to, to Japan, for example, who, who wants to then kind of use that in their energy system. I think there's, uh, there is different roles for different players. And I guess it's not clear yet who's going to sort of own, own that space. Yeah. Earlier, when we were talking about batteries and the different maturity stage of different battery technologies, when you're developing projects, how do you decide when a technology is mature enough, when that it's good enough to invest money behind? What I look for is projects that have been, you know, there's a commercial operating project, for example. Um, you don't, I think, being first of a kind is is pretty hard. It's probably not really where utilities kind of play. They might do small demonstration projects, but if you're spending hundreds of millions of dollars, you don't want to be the first one taking the risk on a new technology. I think that's probably more a role for governments. And, and each country, I think, has various uh, agencies that seek to sort of de-risk those investments or make those investments themselves. And so what I, what I try and look for is proven projects that uh, have been operating ideally in our our market as well, because each market is is pretty unique. But you can't always you can't always have that. So I think demonstrated capability. The other thing I, I really look for as well with new technologies is sort of the team that sit around it as well. <laughs> so if you're if the team that sit around it and the people that are sort of backing a certain technology are really credible, then obviously that gives you greater confidence in the in the technology. Uh, kind of like investing in a startup, I guess, in a way. You sort of sometimes it's a bit unknown. The reality is, though, you know, utilities aren't R and D businesses, or at least many of them aren't. So I think, you know, you try and leverage the de-risking through new technologies, through government processes, as much as you can. And then once you sort of form a view on the level of maturity, then you um, can sort of make an investment yourself. You know, another way to sort of get around that, I guess, is is being involved in a project, but not as an owner, but maybe as a partner. Um, so you might de-risk by maybe doing an offtake. You might not own, you might buy the output. And so you're therefore not taking the technology risk um, that might sit in a separate project vehicle, for example. So you get the benefits of the technology, you get the learnings of the technology, but you don't take the physical 
risk. And that's exactly what happens with that. What's what happened with renewable projects? Uh, you know, you buy the output, and so you know, if the, the project doesn't perform, you don't pay. And when you look at this field of technology, do you feel that what we're waiting for is technology to improve, or are we waiting for capital to implement the options we already have? I don't think that there's a shortage of capital at all. I think there is. The world is awash with capital. There's plenty of capital that wants a nice fixed return, but there's not, um, I guess, the hard bit is capital that wants to take technology risk or merchant risk that is harder capital to find. There is still, I think, certainly from a battery perspective, you know, there's some of those famous charts where you look at the sort of price per kilowatt of a solar cell and the price per kilowatt. Uh, or megawatt of a of a wind wind turbine, and you know they they sort of follow that that amazing learning rate, kind of the in, you know the Moore's law sort of thing, and we're only at the start of that journey, or maybe not at the start. We're probably halfway through that journey for for lithium ion, so there's probably still a way to go. And I think largely because of the electric vehicle industry, because there's just such a big manufacturing push that you get those economies of scale. So I think there's a, there's definitely a technology element to it. And I think there will be new technologies. We've talked a lot about lithium ion and wind and solar, and I, I have no doubt that there will be other forms of storage and generation technologies that will kind of help us get to net zero. Uh, we just don't know what they are yet. Yeah. Let's talk about the different stakeholder groups that you interact with. When you're developing a project, how many different stakeholders get involved and how many do you have to satisfy? It's a lot. There's the people providing the, the capital, so the utility itself or, or the owners of that utility. I mean, there's lots of internal stakeholders, but just thinking internal, externally, you've got to deal with the people building the assets, so the contractors, the EPC, which we talked about. You also need to uh, probably interact with government some way, whether that's for planning approvals or development approvals. If you're doing a new technology, you might be getting funding, um, so you need to interact with government for that. You need to register the project as well. So you need to get the licenses with the market operator. You need to connect to the network. So you need to have an agreement with the network business. You need to have someone to maintain and operate the project, which may be your business, but it might be outsourced. There is a lot. <laughs> it ties back to what, where we started to say that all of these infrastructures have such a huge convening power of different different groups of people that have to come together and it interacts with so many different parts of society, right? After all, we build these infrastructures in order to meet those 100% demand obligations, satisfy internal operations as well within the company. When did you first get exposed to some of these issues that made you want to work with an electric utility? Uh, well, I was originally, as I mentioned before, I was originally in, in consulting, in strategy consulting, and I did a lot of different projects in different different industries that and I sort of gravitated to the ones that had real assets and I guess over time wanted to kind of pivot my career into a field that was going through a lot of change felt like it was doing something to do with sustainability and climate change but was dealing with big infrastructure projects and I guess through that decided the energy sector and then I I went into energy economic advisory also at Deloitte, and then worked in that field for a while. And, and so I guess that was the sort of testing the waters of the sector, understanding the different aspects of the energy sector, because it is, you know, obviously project development is just a small part of it. Well, big part, but there's lots of other parts of the energy sector. Uh, and so through through that, that role in economic advisory, I got exposure to lots of renewable developers because, you know, economic advisors often provide price forecasts for debt due diligence, actually. So if the developer wants to go and get project finance, then they'll get an external advisor to provide a view on forward price curves. And so through that, and as well as lots of other sort of energy related projects, really honed in on to finding development and project development really interesting. But as a consultant, you don't really have any skin in the game, right? Like you're, you're providing advice, but you don't think of the idea, you don't sort of originate the concept or the opportunity and so that's why I guess I kind of wanted to go on to, it's sort of like going on to the buy side, I guess, if you're in the M&A world, you know, you're going on to the developer side, you sort of get to control the destiny a little bit. I mean, there's lots of other factors, but I guess, yeah, I thought utilities would be a cool place to, to do that. And back to your earlier point about 
you know, the fact that vertically integrated utilities can sort of back their own assets as well, I thought it was a great place to be able to execute on those development ideas and opportunities, whereas that can be a bit more challenging as a, as a sort of independent developer. Yeah. Were you surprised by the level of complexity of the stakeholders and the issues that were involved? I wouldn't say I was surprised. I think I sort of gravitated towards that. I think that's exactly why I love it. I think there's a, there's a little bit not to overbake the, the, the area, but it's a little bit entrepreneurial in a way. Uh, and I probably don't have the guts to be a proper entre- entrepreneur. There's a bit of the sort of intrapreneur, I guess you would call it. Developing a project is starting a little business. Uh, and that's super exciting. You have all of the aspects of financing it and all of the aspects of getting buy-in and understanding the revenue side, managing cost, uh, setting up a team, getting sort of getting all the bits to work. And I think that's the bit I, I loved and I gravitated towards that. Um, so I, yeah, I guess I wasn't surprised. I actually, that's exactly what I, what I wanted. What is it about complexity that made you want to seek it out? It's the variety that it brings in your day-to-day job, which I find really exciting. In that complexity comes variety and no one project is the same. And so because projects broadly have the same you know, areas, but in each project, it's going to be a different one that sort of fires as a problem or an issue or a challenge and therefore something that is interesting, that you're learning something new. It may seem like it's the same thing each time. There is always something new to learn. It might be that the EPC contract's really complex or the technology landscape's really complex or the political or regulatory landscape is really complex or the business case just doesn't stack up and there needs to be some financial engineering or whatever it might be. And sort of in each project, you you might be dealing with a different challenge and then a really hard project might have all of them. <laughs> so complexity basically gives you job variety. Yeah, I think so. I think so. And then there's the sort of change over time aspect. I think the energy sector, because of the need to decarbonize, is by definition going to have to go through sort of existential change. And I'm 32 now and for the next 30 years, I think that's going to be the same, right? So for my career, really, I hope, and I hope we get there to net zero, I think it's going to be an incredibly exciting and challenging thing to dedicate my career to. For sure. I think it's incredibly exciting as well. Good luck to you on that. To a student or early career professional, what skill or expertise would you encourage them to learn? I think the people I like working with, maybe I'll answer through that sort of lens or have working for me on projects are those that have curiosity. I guess you, how do you learn curiosity? I don't know. But having curiosity, if you can try and demonstrate curiosity and as a consequence of being curious, I think continue to learn and seek answers and have that learning mindset. Yeah, that's probably the kind of other way to describe it. Having that learning mindset is just so important, no matter what industry you're in. If I were to think of something else, I think learning how to communicate and be structured in your thinking, something to learn. And you can learn this and you do learn, the MBA sort of has has courses on this. You know, you learn the Minto method, for example, of structured thinking, structured problem solving. I think communicating your ideas is just such an important skill set and it can be learnt and it can be honed and that's how you able to get your idea sold and people to buy into it and so whether that's a pitch for an entrepreneurial venture or whether that's an internal business idea or a project development or just something that you want to get your your boss or your partner to kind of listen to i think being able to communicate in a structured way is is really valuable Absolutely. And and sometimes that curiosity helps tackle the complexity because there's there's a humbleness of knowing that there's more to know and there's the seeking of what else is there that I'm missing and what I'm lacking. Yes, agreed. Definitely agree. Stuart, thank you so much for uh, taking your time. It was a pleasure to getting a chance to chat with you today. Jimmy, thanks very much for having me and uh, you really enjoyed the chat. Thank you for listening to the Levers of Exchange podcast, where we share ideas, knowledge, and best practices for achieving a sustainable future. I'm the host, Jimmy Gia, and the music is by Sean Hart. Thanks again to the Skoll Center for Social Entrepreneurship at the Said Business School, Oxford University, for sponsoring Season 3 of this podcast. Please subscribe to our podcast for new episodes and share with a friend. Please visit our website, 
at www.leversofexchange.com for additional episodes, books, and other resources. Thank you again. And remember, the cleantech economy will require everyone's participation. How can we exchange ideas today to help you find your role tomorrow?